Welcome to a brand new video on insulin production and secretion. So as we get into this video today, let's look at our checklist of things we want to discuss today. And first we want to answer a simple question is what is insulin? Um, we want to look at where it's produced, how it's produced, and then how we secrete it um, in a, an active beta cell. So as we look at that, let's answer that very first question. What is insulin? Well, insulin is in itself, it is a peptide hormone. So we are dealing with insulin, and insulin is a peptide hormone. Now what does that mean? It is means that it is made up of a sequence of amino acids um, and uh, that come together to make a protein, a small um, a sequence here. Now insulin, uh, when we uh, start off with this, this uh, uh, is, is somewhat of a small protein. It's about 51 amino acids in size. Uh, so it's one of the short uh, polypeptide kind of proteins that we would have um, rather than glycoproteins. So we see it's what we consider a short polypeptide, less than 200 amino acids, definitely. And this hormone's job is to lower your blood glucose and other nutrients. So we're going to lower blood glucose levels, other nutrient levels in the body. After someone has feed, uh, after they have fed on some nutrients, uh, you're going to see the blood levels of these nutrients increase, and the body needs to lower these to keep these under control. And this is why it's such an important hormone to understand. It's crucial in uh, diabetes uh, and managing these diseases. So now that we know what it is, Let's look at where it is made. And where it is made is in the pancreas, which is an endocrine and exocrine gland in the body, uh, situated to, so, near the stomach uh, in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And inside, there's a variety of cells. There's some exocrine cells that make digestive enzymes, but there are endocrine cells here called the islets, or islets of Langerhans, and these cells are endocrine, and that is what's important here uh, for insulin, is these islets make the hormone insulin. So if we were to look inside, we would see a series of cells kind of in a circle, and there's a variety of cells in the islets that I'll mention, um, one of which I'm going to go ahead and talk about first is the cell that makes insulin called beta cells. And if you imagine that beta cells are like a beautiful woman at a party, a uh, beautiful woman at a party is going to be surrounded by lots of guys who want her attention. And one of the guys that surround her are your alpha males who are surrounding um, this beautiful woman. And so the alpha males, they're going to try to talk sweet to her, try to get her attention, um, and they're going to, because uh, alpha cells make glucagon to raise blood sugar, and then beta cells are going to make insulin to lower it, so she's going to take their sweetness. And then the other uh, ones here are either guys that are too ugly to get a beautiful woman, so they are the dogs, and they're just too ugly, or they're her friends. Uh, the F cells. F cells make pancreatic polypeptide, things like that. Delta cells um, make your growth hormone inhibiting hormones that we'll see. So what's going to basically happen is when, uh, and this is a very interesting thing, is when beta cells produce insulin, then insulin will go out to your alpha cells and suppress their production of glucagon, um, which is a type of uh, apocrine, uh, kind of, not apocrine, but paracrine. So this is a paracrine communication. Sorry for my slip of the tongue there. Sometimes these lit islets are called islets of Langerhans after the guy who discovered and described them, islets of Langerhans after Dr. Langerhans. So let's take a look at uh, a little bit about insulin production. Now, insulin is a peptide, and like all peptides, they are made through mostly the same pathway. And so we're going to take a look, and let's say I have a cell here, and this is going to be a beta cell. 
And this beta cell, my pancreas, is sitting here. So this is a beta cell in the pancreas. And like all cells that are in our body, that are our body cells, they have a nucleus. And inside this nucleus will be some DNA. And there will be a chromosome in here that I want to make note of. It's chromosome number 11. The 11th chromosome has on its short end, the P end, a gene that codes for insulin. So if we have a gene that codes for insulin here, um, you're going to have an organelle standing nearby this nucleus called the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. So we have our nucleus and our endoplasmic reticulum in the nucleus. You're going to produce a hormone here, uh, insulin. It's very early structures and we'll talk about its very early structures in a moment but what's going to happen is this hormone will go to the endoplasmic reticulum here and be assembled into a simple kind of structure that it possesses and I will go over it very simply at the moment um, and discuss it a little bit uh, we'll get in more into that momentarily but this then gets packaged into another vesicle, this hormone. And this hormone, this is the route that all peptides will take in the body, or at least majority of them, except, you know, there are some who skip part of it because they're synthesized, uh, their primary structures made by a, uh, um, a free ribosome, ribosome floating around in the cytoplasm. And then we have another organelle here, called the Golgi apparatus, or just Golgi. In the Golgi, this vesicle is going to go into the Golgi, and it's going to get, as the Golgi works as a post office, this protein is uh, going to get modified in such a way, um, and it will get modified into some piece parts, and then this vesicle will then be able to be released by the Golgi and sit and wait for secretion of the hormone. So we're going to see that it goes through your typical um, cellular route for protein trafficking, uh, starting in the nucleus, going to the endoplasmic reticulum, using vesicles to travel to the Golgi to be produced, modified furtherly, and then being uh, sitting in a vesicle waiting to be excreted under the right time. So now that we kind of get an idea of its basic production, let's look biochemically what happens at each stage in this process at some of the biochemistry of this protein. And we're going to take a look at it. And we're going to start here. Um, and uh, before we go to the ER, uh, we're going to produce a basic structure of this guy before going to the endoplasmic reticulum, um, kind of what happens very shortly after production. So we're going to start off with a little unit here, and if I can get my drawings to work the way I want to, is we're going to start off with a little unit here, and I'm going to put a black line there representing that this is a unique unit. This is um, about a 24 amino acid length section. It's about 24 amino acids long, this section, and it is your N-terminus signal peptide part. Uh, so this is your N-terminus signal peptide. And then there will be another region of it. And I'm going to draw this in purple, some kind of a purple color here. Um, and uh, this region of it coming on down here, this is actually its beta chain. And I'm going to draw another black line here so we can reference that there is a separate chain here. And then we're going to draw a curve going all the way up and down. Now, I urge you to draw with me. This is going to be known as the C-peptide section of it, C-peptide. And then we're going to use a different color here. Uh, let's use green to depict this section here and this section here is going to be its alpha chain and the alpha chain is another section that's going to be important later on so what's going to happen is this protein that we've made with its unique structures is going to go on 
uh, and be moved to the endoplasmic reticulum in the beta cells. So we're going to go to the beta cells, ER, endoplasmic reticulum, and you're going to get some modifications start to happen. And one of the things that's going to happen is we're going to draw the uh, starting at your alpha, uh, the beta chain. We're going to start at the beta chain here, and we're going to draw down. And we're going to make sure we know that that stops there. We're going to draw the remaining part of the C-peptide, come down here. And we're going to draw the alpha chain here. What we are going to show is, is this N-terminus C-peptide here has been removed when we get to the endoplasmic reticulum, and uh, that's one of the main modifications that happens, is this N-terminus signal peptide, that little 24 amino acid length chunk, has been removed off of your beta chain. So the little beta chain here, the beta chain uh, is left, and then your alpha chain sitting over here, is going to be also reminding with the C-peptide part of this protein. And there's a couple other modifications that are going to be happening here. We're going to receive a couple bonds right here. These bonds are a type of special covalent bond that occurs in tertiary structures of proteins called a disulfide bridge. Disulfide bridge. And so what that is, is we have a sulfur-sulfur covalent bond between the R groups of the protein, uh, forming what we refer to as tertiary structures of proteins. And then there is another disulfide bond here on the alpha chain, going from one part of the alpha chain to another part of the alpha chain that we have on this as well. So this modification has happened as we went into the ER. The ER takes what we have and let's give some names. We started out with a molecule called pre-pro-insulin and now I have made pro-insulin. Now it is probably up to the point that you understand when you have pro in front of something, it is a pro-hormone, it is inactive, and this is before we become pro-insulin, so pre-pro-insulin still has the N-terminus and has not gotten the disulfide bridges. Pro-insulin has had the N-terminus signal peptide section removed and also has gotten the disulfide bridges. So we have that interesting chemistry has happened there. Lastly, we're going to send this to the Golgi, where it's going to become insulin. And how does that happen? Well, we're going to take a look at, first off, we're going to have some cleaving that's going to happen. So we are going to have our, our beta chain here, our beta, and our alpha chain here. And remember, there are those disulfide bridges that were formed. And we're going to cleave your C-peptide off of that. The C-peptide is cleaved. And so the alpha and beta chains here is what is going to be insulin. So insulin is a dimer made up of an alpha chain and a beta chain where the C-peptide is also produced. Now, as we look at some of these, let's describe some characteristics. First off, your insulin protein here with its dimer is about 51 amino acids in length where your C-peptide is 31. Now, the reason why it is so much shorter is, even though it looks bigger, is it's not a dimer. And also some things that we need to make sure we understand clinically, this has got some very important clinical significance, is that your active insulin has a half-life. And the half-life of it is somewhere between three to five minutes Whereas the half-life of C-peptide is actually 20 to 30 minutes in blood. And there's a couple big reasons for that. Insulin, when it's released in the bloodstream, and we're going to see how that happens momentarily, basically it's going to go what we call first-pass metabolism because it's going to be released into the venous drainage. 
ending up in the liver, and the liver's got enzymes and stuff that are going to break down insulin. So insulin's got a very early uh, removal. C peptide is not going to be removed by first pass, so it's going to last about 20 to 30 minutes. And you also note a very important thing that I want to stress here is that these two, the C peptide and the insulin, are released at a one to one ratio, equal isomolar amount. This is incredibly important from a clinical standpoint. Why is this? Well, insulin being removed very quickly and has a half-life of three to five minutes, and the half-life of, of C-peptide being so much longer is very useful in analysis with patients so let's say you've got a patient who might have some, uh, who, uh, who is a diabetic. What's going to happen is we're going to look at these. Uh, now also I just want to mention that uh, the C-peptide uh, range being 1 to 1 here is uh, about 0 0.3 to 0.6 nanomoles per liter. Um, and uh, it's, um, it, it's got a little bit of a, a, of a higher concentration in the bloodstream after uh, first pass uh, gets rid of insulin. And they're one-to-one, -one, so there's going to be more of it in the bloodstream. So it's very good uh, as, a, uh, um, as an indicator for beta cell activity, how well the beta cells are working. It also seems to be a very good predictor for how your patient will respond to hypoglycemic agents like sulfonylureas, you know, metformin, etc., uh, to some other drugs out there. And there's some other drugs that become very important from a pharmacological standpoint that you'll look at that are hypoglycemic agents for the diabetic patients and C-peptide levels are very good indicator for that. Now, we're not going to get into why that is right now, but um, so if you drew this with me, we have a good understanding now of the biochemical process going on here. Now we want to look at what happens in a beta cell. What happens in a typical beta cell? So we're going to draw our beta cell here, sitting in the islet of Langerhans. So, of course, this is a beta cell and the islets of Langerhans. And now that we've produced it, we know there's a nucleus. We know that's all going on, and that's not what we're going to talk about here. So if you, are in, if you need to go back to this diagram just to understand that we've gotten to this point here, we are now going to get it in a vesicle. So that's the first thing I want to do here. Very first thing I want to do is I want to take insulin and C-peptide and put that in to my, um, uh, to my drawing. So I'm going to have my C-peptides my, uh, and my alpha beta chain. My beta chain, my alpha chain, my disulfide bridges for insulin and my C-peptide, who is an equal isomolar one-to-one -one amounts. And we have him produced, packaged in a vesicle, and ready to be secreted into the bloodstream, ready to do its job. So how do we control this? Well, first off, there's some very interesting biochemical signaling that's going to happen here. And the biochemical signals that are going to happen here has a lot to do with metabolism. But as we get into that, let's draw a particular receptor protein uh, that we need a transporter. And I'm just going to use red for this. It's just easy to see. And we're going to draw a transport protein that's going to allow us to bring some glucose in. And glucose comes through as it is a large polar compound, has to travel into cells, through some kind of facilitated transport, facilitated diffusion. To do this, we have a protein that works in both directions called the GLUT2. GLUT2, glucose transporter class 2. 
GLUT2. Now, the, uh, there's other types of glucose transport. There's insulin-dependent glucose transport. But if you ever have to know on any kind of questions, on any kind of like pharmacology, pathophysiology, who has GLUT2, or, uh, this is actually borrowed from Dr. Najib lectures, but beta cells like GLUT2. So beta cells, liver, intestines, kidneys, all have GLUT2 and do not need insulin to transport glucose in. So when glucose is brought in, glucose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, a 6 carbon glucose is brought in. Uh, and it can leave, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, but let's add some protein channels and discuss this as well. One of the protein channels I want to talk about that's extremely important for our understanding is a protein channel that is going to be guarded and opened by metabolism. And this one here, let's shade him in in purple here, this dark deep purple, this is a potassium channel that will let potassium come in and it is regulated by the presence of a somewhat high energy compound called adenosine diphosphate. So what this is is an ADP gated potassium channel. And potassium can come in as long as ADP is bound to it. And potassium is going to come in keeping the charge at a different level. Now what's going to happen is fairly shortly after glucose is brought in on the 6 carbon, you're going to add a phosphate to this. And this is, I know it doesn't seem that important, but what happens, you make a molecule called glucose... 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate. In glucose 6-phosphate, because the 6th carbon got a phosphate, can no longer bind to a GLUT2 and go back out. It's important because this glucose diffusion into a GLUT2 is going to behave as the signal to start to release glucose because when glucose levels outside this cell rise and it starts to come in through GLUT2 receptors, GLUT2 transporters, and we bring it in, this glucose molecule will then enter the mitochondria, your mitochondria of the beta cells, and go through cellular respiration. So ATP synthesis is going to occur here through cellular respiration. Now, if you guys know that cellular respiration's goal is to take ADP and convert that to ATP, you are regenerating ADP into ATP. Well, where have we seen some ADP? Right here on the potassium channel, I can take ADP, will start to be pulled off these potassium channels and being converted into ATPs and that will shut these potassium channels. Now, when the charge of this cell starts to change because of this, this will open a very important type of channel protein here, a voltage-gated calcium channel. And we have a voltage-gated calcium channel here, and calcium will diffuse in Ca++. Two pluses because there's two extra protons. And what that's going to do is, is calcium is going to promote the release, the exocytosis of a vesicle, just like with neurons. So what's going to occur is, this is going to move up, fuse with the phospholipid bilayer of any kind of cell. And because they are made of the same substance, they're both made of phospholipids, you're going to have the release at equal amounts here, very important, of your alpha and beta chains of insulin. And then also your C-peptide. 
and that C peptide, you have that one to one ratio of release in the bloodstream after exocytosis. Remember, that is release of materials out of a cell using a vesicle. Now, drugs like metformin, uh, what uh, your um, molecules like that, um, the uh, we're going to see they're going to help uh, do some other things like favor the release of insulin. They're going to work um, as a hypoglycemic agent, sulfonylureas, things like that. They're going to uh, actually stimulate the release of insulin for a patient. So um, these, this process here, um, now that we've made insulin, we saw how that happens, and now we saw how we secrete it. And two very important things, because both of these processes are targets for drugs, things we need to manipulate in patients. Um, so I really hope you found this video helpful. If you're trying to study this in your programs of study, let me know if there's videos out there that I've done that help you. Uh, what topics you would like to see. I'm always excited to do these. This has been one I have looked forward to doing for a long time and just finally had that opportunity. But I'm so glad you took the time to watch this video. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss more future videos from me. And as always, thanks for watching.